shark team. Well, welcome everybody. My name is Carmen Kopfer. I'm a shark researcher and I've been working with a nonprofit organization, a Mexican nonprofit organization from uh, 2015. And I moved to California since 2019 and I started working with shark stewards since 2020. And we, went, we have been working with sharks, with baby sharks, right? Say hi, this is Govinda. She's gonna be my gray white shark, my little baby gray white shark, because here in California we have a nursery area. Do you know where's a nursery area? No, any idea? I hear baby sharks, that's correct, exactly. So California is gonna be really important for different species of sharks, but one of the most representative is gonna be the gray white shark, leopard sharks, and seven gill sharks. So currently, hey. oh yes, You're, are you finding this? Thank you. Currently we are having a few projects uh, talking about conservation sharks, but I hear that you have some questions, so feel free to interrupt me or if you have any questions that you would like to address right now we can start from there or I can start like giving a, a little small speech what do you prefer speech first okay so um, I like to talk about why sharks are important in the ecosystem we have heard that they're like super cool animals but why do we care about sharks do you have any idea why will they be really cool Yes? They're, they're, yes? They're an apex predator. Yell at me. Yes? Exactly. A key species means if they disappear. Give it a clap. I have a marine biologist right here. I love that. That means if we remove that key species, we have a cascade effect, which means it's detrimental for the whole ecosystem. It can collapse the whole ecosystem. So an ocean, a healthy ocean, we can measure a healthy ocean by the presence of these apex predators. So right now we are in very difficult times in our ocean. We have 20 years to switch our habits or the whole ecosystem is gonna change and maybe her, her next generation, they're not gonna be able to see a whale, a shark, a dolphin, and many other species we're facing one of the massive extinctions in, in the times of humanity. So we only have 20 years. That sounds like really fast, but I was 15 yesterday. So we need to change this. And why do we care about the ocean? Like, well, I don't eat shark, I don't eat dolphins, and what, like, what is important if they disappear? Love that. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Thank you so much. Yes, I'm, I'm just going to repeat what she said because not everybody were super close. So if the sharks disappear or the eco, if the ecosystem collapse, we depend straight from the ocean, not only because we get our source of food and our climate change, but if you like to breathe oxygen, we need to take care of the ocean because this first um, step in the food chain is gonna be the plankton, which is producing the oxygen, oxygen that we breathe. And it's not coming only for the, from the forest. 75% of the planet is covered in ocean water, right? And if in the ocean water is the phytoplankton, that means more than 70% of our oxygen is coming from the ocean. So if the ocean gets sick, we are in trouble, big, big, big trouble. So that's why it's important to keep the whole ecosystem healthy. Thank you so much. I have another hand over there. Yes. Yeah, the food chain. Yes, the whole ecosystem. Exactly, everything is connected. Yes, thank you for saying that. And we depend directly for, from the ocean. We cannot leave without them, right? It's our source of water, our source of the climate, climb. I'm sorry, my, my pronunciation sometimes is gonna be tricky. I'm trying my best. Let me know if I say something weird. We can correct it. Okay, so now we know. Okay, sharks are important. And 
they are in trouble. We are facing one of the massive extinctions and from 1980s, 80% 80 of the sharks were already gone. Mm -hmm. And by this year, there's some studies that is up to 90 something, 95, 92, the, right? So that means 90% of the sharks in the world disappeared already, mm -hmm. but why? Raise your hand if you eat shark. Do you eat shark? <laughs> they don't even tell you. Yes. Warming of the ocean. Hmm. That's a really good guess. Um. There's a lot of fishery and a lot of bycatch. So here in America, we don't have the culture to eat sharks per se. But there's many other places in the world where they will consume the fins. So they will grab the shark. They will fish this little shark. And they will cut the dorsal fins right in the tail and they will sell it to the asian market and just the meat is going to be really low quality because it's, it has a high concentration of heavy metals what is that those are chemicals that we don't want in our blood right because we cannot take it out from our system and they accumulate and they can produce a lot of different disease like mercury cadmium lead and um, among other ones. So the, the flesh is gonna be really low quality. Uh, two pounds is gonna be around one dollar in value. But the fiends, they're gonna, they're gonna be making a soup as a final product and one little tiny soup is gonna be up to hundred dollars, just one plate of shark fin soup. So it's a big problem. Also, a, f a few decades ago, we used to use the liver fat to do some pills, and we used to use it in cosmetics, squalina, squalene. That's the other component who came out as a, um, the alternative to synthesize this, this chemical so we can still have our vaccines and our makeup and all the things that we want without killing sharks. But there's still a big problem, and it's called bycatch, which means in order to get our food, we throw in the ocean big, big nets, huge nets, and we got everything in those nets. So not only sharks are getting there, but also dolphins, tuna, turtles, baby whales, everything there. Who likes to eat baby whales? Nobody wants to eat baby whales. No one wants to eat sharks, right? But they're still getting there. So that's called bycatch. And bycatch is another huge problem for the sharks populations. So, okay, this is so bad. And what can we do? Well, researchers, we are doing many things. First, we need to, meet, to know more about sharks. We only know from the ocean, only 5%. Um, we know more about space than the ocean. So we start studying them. So we want to know the difference between sharks, right? So how do we do that? There's many, many ways to see it. Here, for example, I have a, a jaw from a gray white shark. It's a juvenile, just like the ones that we have here in California. This is a baby. This is gonna be a, a baby, like five feet baby shark. And this is the one that we're gonna have here in California. It's gonna uh, fit prima, prima, prima principle, like primarily on rays and small fish. They're not gonna eat uh, marine mammals yet because they're too little. And we can tell that this is a great white shark because the teeth are completely um, triangular and it's serrated in the, the edges. You wanna touch it? Touch it. Ooh. Right? And this is gonna work like a, a cutting bread, uh, a knife for cutting bread. And another difference with this one, this is going to be a Mako shirt. This is an adult and this is going to be like a fork. The edges are going to be super smooth and it's going to be very pointy like a, like a fork because it wants to grab and swallow. So the different teeth are going to not only indicate the different species, but also it's going to tell us what is the animal eating and where does it live. So this is going to be a pelagic animal, which means open ocean, because it's going to catch the fastest prey in the ocean. This one here is going to eat sea mammals when it grows, right? So we want to know about biology. How do they live the life story? Hmm, but how can we do those things? So, we tag our animals. What does that mean? Well, we put little earrings, like me. 
So we grab the baby shark and we put a little baby, a, a little earring, right? And the shark, and then the shark, we release the shark and it goes away and it, we collect data like that. So I'm gonna pass around some pictures of our receptors and some of the tags that we use. Of course, they're not only being used for sharks, but in many different species. And we're gonna have different kinds of this ones. They're gonna be satellite. We can share, we can pass them. Pass it. We're gonna have acoustic tags and satellite tags, which means some of them, they're gonna go in the dorsal fin here. And every time the sharks pops to the surface, the uh, tag is gonna send a signal um, yes, I have more. To satellite, and we want to collect data and temperature, uh, speed, uh, location, like a little tiny GPS, how many times it comes to the surface, how long it, it took to come to the surface, how deep it went, etc., etc. Then we're going to have the acoustic tags, which means we have to do like a little tiny surgery. So we grab the baby shark, we do like a little opening right here in the belly. And we have another tag. We put it inside, it's gonna be like this size, depends on the uh, design of the tag, we have many different ones. We put it inside and we give some stitches, we put it back and we release the animal. This is gonna have to be used with a receptor that is also floating around, right there with the pitches, which is gonna be like, look like, like a water bottle that we connect in the bottom of the ocean. We put a weight on the bottom, a buoy in the top, so that thing is hanging, and every time the shark passes like three miles around that thing, it's gonna like collect the beeping. So we're gonna know where is it, the animal, and how many times it comes, and the battery is gonna long, uh, last longer, like a, a couple of years, depends on the brand. So in that, in that way, we can know, we have a, um, like a, a net of receptors all the way from California to South America. So we know how the animals migrate. And why do we want to know where the animals are moving? Because we want to know where the babies are. So that in that way, we can protect the babies, we can protect the pregnant mamas, and that's how we start recovering the population, right? So that's one of the part of the study and the research the shark stewards in Pelagios Kakunka we are doing. And then we want to know about the behavior. So now this is the part that you are coming. Not only researchers can help to save the sharks, but you have an important role in the health of the ecosystem. You can help us to save sharks. How can we, how can you do that? You can start passing those. Oh yes. Do you have an idea now about where they are? Yes. If you go inside Ocean Institute and you're gonna have uh, the tank, the shark tank, the touch tanks all the way in the back. And on the right side, we're gonna have a touch screen and right there, we're gonna have the IDs of individuals depending on the area. And you can click on each one and you're gonna see when was tagged which species, species it is, how big it is, and where it has been moving just here in California. If you want to see like the whole data is like, a, it's, it's in the cloud, right? In a big net and a system that is called Migramar, that is like the, the um, union and the partnership between many different researchers from California all the way to South America. That net is Migramar, you can Google it, and you can have access to see all the animals moving, and you're not only gonna have sharks, but you're also gonna have like another endangered species. Um, so now, we were talking about how can you help us? So you're gonna have different ways that you can help. Please send this back. I'm gonna give you another one. So we don't, we are not full of paper, and we don't make more trash in the ocean. So one of the ways that you can help first, of course, the trash, right? I wanna give you like a, a a great clap, please give yourself a clap because you are giving the first step. We don't need perfect people. We need everybody to do their best, right? Not everybody can go vegan. Not everybody can be a marine biologist. Not everybody wants to be doing, like donating money, but you can give whatever is in your possibilities your best. And if everybody does a little tiny thing, then everybody collectively, we can make the switch. Just like the plankton, right? The plankton feeds one of the biggest animals in the world, which is the blue whale. So just like that, we can be the little tiny plankton 
and unite, we can we can change this around. There's still hope. And that hope is called uh, hope spots, like Sylvia Aaron called them hope spots. There are gonna be places they are the local communities are starting to switch their activities because there's places in the world where they still fish and shark, right? Because that Asian market that is eating fish shark and soup, they have to get it from somewhere, right? So we are doing, this is the next part of the project that we are working with. Um, we are targeting those communities that are ready to do that switch and they're switching to ecotourism. So if you like to travel, go to places that are um, that are doing these changes, where the community is changing from the commercial fishing to ecotourism, to sport fishing, or to a different alternatives. So that's one way that you can start doing it. I'm going to start passing this one. It's going to be about what I'm talking about. So one is going to be about like the sustainable ecotourism. Another one is going to say, what are you eating? Maybe you're like me, you have a baby, and you're like, I don't have right now the edge to go diving with sharks, right? She's not she's not the age appropriate to start scuba diving. But I can I can control what I'm eating, right? So this local community is gonna they're gonna be doing sport fishing, ecotourism, which means you can go swim with sharks, just like here in La Jolla, but you can go and get to see leopard sharks. Or they're gonna be changing to a more sustainable fishery, which means they're going with a single line instead of using big nets. And they're gonna have like a different sizes that they can start fishing. Just like the regulations that we have here with the white sea bass, then now after the popul population decrease, we start tagging the animals, same process. Now you only have a season that you can go to catch some sea bass, white sea bass, and you have to catch the big ones. You are not allowed to catch the juveniles. Same thing, but with sharks and with different species. So now those ones, um, they're gonna be catch with a different certifications. Like for example, there's gonna be one page like this running around. This is from Agua Verde. It's a place in the Gulf of California. The, the fishermen, they realize that they're get, running out of food, right? The fish is going down, the prices are going down, everything's dropping and they're like, well, if we don't fish, we don't eat, but we are killing the ocean. So what can we do? The switch that I'm talking about. So they certify themselves. And now when they cut the fish, they stab, They put like a little stuff in the brain. So the fish dies immediately, no suffer. So you don't have cortisol. And they um, cut the tail. So they pull out all the, the blood in the, in the water before they put it in the ice. So the quality of the, the meat goes up, right? So. It's more valuable in the market, and they have to catch less to, to get the same profit. And now you can, if you see this page, please scan the QR with your phone, and it's gonna, tell, it's gonna take you to a link where you can see where the animal was caught, with, uh, what type of fishery they were using, uh, when, species, and by who. So we call it in Spanish tras, trazabilidad, which means you see exactly how your food is coming and how fresh it is. Mm. And this is a different type of food that you can get if you go to, the, if you go to those places. And if you're like, oh, come on, Carmen. Man, I don't have access to that type of food. I'm just here and I just wanna go to, to buy my food around here. Okay, we have another option for you too. You're gonna have some certifications, some logos in the cans that you buy that is gonna say that it's been cut with a line instead of with a net. So there's many options for you as a consumer, as a tourism, and also, if you can support, of course, and donate, there's a huge, huge help for this effort that we have to do everybody collectively with the sharks. Okay, I talk a lot. Right now, you have any doubt? There's something you want to talk about? Yes. Um, what about the recent attacks? The recent attacks, here is it's been a lot of attacks. Well, not a lot, but more than we used to attacks with gray white shark. I don't I don't like to call them attacks. I like to call them unfortunate unfor unfortunate encounters, like bad encounters with sharks. So as I was telling you, here in California we are a nursery area, right? So we are starting um, 
to cohabit humans and sharks. And normally, this used to be a nursery area, which means only babies and juveniles used to be here. But now, because we're being really successful here in California, we ban the shark fin trade, which means we're not cutting adults. And we are protecting the, the great white sharks here. They're like completely safe in California. So the populations started to Im improve here around California and down there in Mexico. So we have more adults, right? And also, have you noticed that the climate change, the temperatures have changed? Lately has been a little bit more warmer, right? So all these changes in the environment are changing the behavior of the animals. So where before only the, the juveniles were here, now we're starting to see more adults. And they normally used to migrate to the shark cafe, which is, um, if you have California right here, and then you have the uh, Baja, the Gulf of Mexico, they start migrating like a, 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 an island right here. It is called like the shark cafe. Um, and now we have more adults around here. They start to stay here and hanging out. So we start having more uh, possibilities to encounter those adults, which means we need to educate ourselves. This is the last component. If you are in an area where you are more likely to face a shark, you need to educate yourself on how to interact and how to have a safe practices with sharks, whatever you are, scuba diving, free diving, snorkeling, paddle boarding, or surfing and here's a big surfing area so we need to have good practices this there's a lot of certifications and a lot of courses all over the world about how to interact with sharks depends on the activity that you are performing is the different protocol observation protocol that you have to have and even if you are not attempting to see gray, gray white sharks you need to know the protocol for example give me a second who knows how to behave if you find a bear what should we do if we find a bear in the woods, if we go to Big Bear? You need to know what to do if you find a bear because you are going to a place where bears are, right? So what do you do if you see a, a bear? Do you run? What do you do? You get big and, and what else? And you make noise. Why you want to make noise? What are you trying to do? You're trying to scare the bear. You're trying to pretend to be another predator so the bear doesn't come and catch you. If you run away from a bear, that thing runs faster than anybody here. You wanna get down? Okay, down. Same thing with the shark. We are clumsy in the water, no? We are so clumsy in the water. So if you, if you try to run or swim out from a great white shark, you're not gonna do it. And you're gonna look like a prey. So, really fast, observation protocols. If you get to see a gray white shark and you are in a, in a board, you f move your board, you are in your board, whatever is a paddle board or a surfboard, you're aware of a, oh. you realize that you have, you have a shark, you put the tip of your paddle board towards the shark so the shark can feel that you are aware that he's there. You do not swim out, like, out. You stay there, you hold your spot, because the shark is gonna circulate you. This is like a um, investigating behavior. He's not gonna come right away to you. When a shark comes and grabs you, it's because you're being clumsy and it has been around you for at least five minutes. Of course, they're gonna have seven cents. We only have five, so they're gonna see you, feel you, smell you before you are aware that they're there. But as soon as you see it, you put your, your paddle board in front of him and you say, I know you're here. You put your arms and your legs in the paddle board, not in the water, please, and try to step back in a safety way, like slow. If the shark is coming, you do not move, you stay there, right? Because that's giving him the, it's like doing the rah, like, right? Like I'm another predator and I'm willing to fight you. This is a really cool tip about sharks. They do not fight for their food. As predators, they want to take the prey that is more, the most easy with the lowest cost. Because if they fight for the food and they get injured, they can decrease their possibilities to survive and to hunt. So that's not a good cost for them. They want the easy prey, 
right? So if you remove the surprise factor, that already decreased 50% of the probabilities that the shark is gonna come get you. But it's gonna circulate you, it's gonna stay there until he loses the interest and he moves away. Now, if you're not aware of the shark and it comes too close to you, then you need to know what to do if you get a bite. We have a lot of sharks here, and this is not the first bad encounter we have with sharks. So you, if you're going in the water, you need to know how to perform a first, uh, how, how do you say? Uh, primeros auxilios? First aid. First aid for a bite. <laughs> There's a lot of places you can get this information. You can go to shark stewards. You can go um, to the, um, there's another pages with uh, the shark lab, with Pelagius Kakunha, like there's many places that you have observation protocols for different activities that you have, for scuba diving, for snorkeling. I actually have a course about that, so if you want to know more about those things, if you're a water person, come to me and we can talk about like that um, observation protocols, depends on the activity that you are doing, and also how to react if you get, you, you see someone that is bit by a shark. Okay. Another question. I know that's like a really yes. I think it was a gray white shark. Yes. As I was saying, like right now we started to see more adults, not only juveniles. So those are the ones that are gonna go for a sea lion and marine mammals. And when we are in the water and we are not looking, if we are in the surface and the shark is looking at us from the bottom. He only sees the shadow. So we look like a sea lion, like a slow one, like an injured one. And if we splash, if we are splashing and we are swimming, we look like a more injured animal. So sharks also like to eat birds. They like chicken. And the movement in the water, the chop, 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 is the key for them to know that it's a bird in the water. So it's like, a, that's a easy prey. So we are completely attracting them with this splashing. That's why we need to swim away slow. And if you are in the water, by the way, I forgot to mention this, the most important key is the eye contact. Making eye contact with the shark. If you lose the eye contact, it's like giving you, like turning around from when, when you're with a bear. It's the same thing, it's another predator, it's just like a bear. You need to look like a predator, do not run, and try to pretend that you're a predator, be big, and keep eye contact. Yes. Um, okay, so baby sharks, um, do they stay with their moms? No, this is something super cool. Okay, sharks, they're gonna have all the different different kinds of reproduction that we can find in other animals, they are gonna have them all. Those are, sharks are older than dinosaurs, older than trees. So they haven't evolved like changing all these things like different animals for a very, very long time. Some sharks, they're gonna put, they're gonna lay some eggs. They're gonna have them in the womb. They're gonna hatch inside the womb and their baby's gonna come out. Some of them, they're gonna have the eggs and they're gonna lay the egg in the seaweed like this one. This is, some, some, sometimes we call them murmur pair, purse. Uh, this is from a swell shark. So they, those ones have like a, like a filaments. Imagine they have like more lines here. So those ones get tangled in the seaweed. This one, in on other hand, this is from a horn shark. Why does it look like this? Because they want to, like twist it like a nail between the rocks. So they're gonna leave uh, the, the egg there, it's gonna hatch in the ocean and leave. Another another sharks, like the great white shark, they're gonna be in the womb and um, the shark is gonna be alive and eat the rest of the animals. So from in, in the uterus, if there were like 10 sharks at the beginning, only one make it out because whoever whoever eats the brothers gets out first. Then you're gonna have the bull shark that has a placenta just like us, and they're gonna give live birth. Um, parents do not uh, take care of the babies. Sharks are the, one of the only species in the world where the babies are like a tiny adult. They're ready, ready to hunt by themselves. Mm. They don't need mama. Actually, some fishermen, they, they have been getting, they have get bit by baby sharks in the womb because they're trying to open them. They put their fingers and they get bit in, from the womb. Yeah, that's a really cool story. <laughs> Another question. Sharks have a 
good sense of smell? Yes, they do have a really good sense of smell, but there's a myth. They do not like just blood because it's blood. Actually, there's like uh, some experiments. They haven't been published properly by the scientific community, but it's been like a, some um, secondhand experiments where uh, they put like three boats with a leaking with blood. One was from cow, cow's blood because it's illegal to use human blood for <laughs> that type of testing, right? Um, another one, they put fish blood, and another one, put, they put human urine. Yeah. Urine. That's the like urine, yeah. And they test the behavior of the sharks, and the sharks only came to the fish blood. No one was interested in the cow's blood, no one's interested in the pee. So, yes, you can pee in your wetsuit. <laughs> yes. They do have a sense of smell, but they are specialized predators. So some sharks are gonna specialize, just like what we talk, they're gonna have a specialized diet, right? Some of them, they're only gonna eat fish. Yeah, thank you. Some of them, they're gonna feel more attractive to marine mammals, which have like a lot of fat, like whales, sea lions. The fat is the thing that they like the most. Right? And some of them, they're gonna be more attractive to, for example, plankton, like the whale shark. You know the whale shark is vegetarian? He doesn't eat meat. It is a shark too. And for example, the horn sharks that we have here in Ocean Institute that you can pet, those ones are gonna have a, like a piggy face because they eat crunchy things like crabs, shells, etc. So no, no because it's a shark, it's gonna eat anything. So that's why many, many, many of the times when a shark gives a bite, it tastes that is like it tastes the tribe the, the the quality of the food that of that meal. So if it thinks it's worth it, it come back and give another bite. But if it's not worth it, it just leave it away. It's like the type of food that you would like, right? Sometimes you will try and you're like and you don't eat it, same thing. The only thing is that they don't have hands. So in order to know if that's food or not. They have to test it. Yes. Um, depends on the activity. It's going to be like the, the potential danger with different species. For example, for scuba divers, the more um, delicate species to dive with will be the tiger shark. For surfers, it's going to be the gray white shark, right? Because it's in the area. Um, and for swimmers, it could be the bull shark because, again, the, the pregnant females, they go up to the river to give birth and they fast before giving birth, just like us. Who likes to eat a hamburger before you give birth? Nobody. <laughs> but after you give birth, you're one, everything that you couldn't eat when you were pregnant. So after the bull shark hits birth, coming back is when it has the bad encounters with swimmers. That's really popular up in Florida. Mm. Right, because you have a higher population of bull sharks. So depends on the activity that you are doing, it's gonna be the day, like the this higher possibility to encounter encounter a species that is that it could be uh, bad for you, that type of activity that you are doing. Also the area, right? So you don't eat where you poop. You have specific places to reproduce, specific places to grow up if you're a baby, specific place, places to hunt. So here in California, it's a nursery area. That's why we don't have a higher uh, encount bad encounters, talking about numbers. But if you go to Guadalupe Island in, in Mexico, that's a, that's a feeding area. So you do not get in the water. It's illegal getting the water there because you will get it because the sharks are there for hunting. So you're gonna look like the prey and they're gonna, of course, they're gonna try to eat you. That's been like a, a lot of problems about this. Actually, in Sonora, it's in, in El Alto Golfo of Mexico because we have a hunting area right there and we have a big fishery of uh, clams and los llamamos cayudas, una, like a clam, big clam. So the fishermen, they go down there with a hookah, like a compressor, and they're fishing, and they're not looking anything, like they're not looking around, and the sharks come and get them. So right now we're like getting more uh, legal policies and more training for those fishermen 
so they can perform the fishery in a safety way and we also can respect the, the sharks. Because it's not that it's it's not that the animals are bad, but they're there that's their hunting area. That's the food source. So it's gonna be more dangerous than a nursery area, right? So it depends on the area, the animal it is, because the activity that it's gonna perform and what are you doing and if you know about your protocols, right? Mm. So it's it's a little bit tricky. Like you have a lot of components to take into account when you are gonna be in the water. Because we are the aliens in the water. They haven't, they never seen a human before. And we are coming to their house. So it's our turn to get educated when we go there. <coughs> right? Yes. Oh, they prefer live food, 100%. Well, okay, depends on the species, right? Um, for example, here are horn sharks. They do not like dead food. No, they prefer dead food because they've been like, um, not trained, but they've changed their behavior over the years. Mm -hmm. We started giving them, uh, when, when we got them, we were giving them uh, f uh, frozen food um like dead food like shrimp calamari and then husbandry tried to introduce live food to keep them entertained and they were like what hell no and they didn't took it <laughs> they fast so we had to go back to to uh that um yeah frozen prep meal for them but in the ocean um sharks like red white sharks and Tiger sharks, they they do want to eat the dead one, the sick one, because they're going to clean the environment, right? They want to, they, yeah, they, they want to keep healthy ecosystem. So everything that is like dying or dead or in bad conditions, they're going to go for that one. So as soon as it's like for a whale, a marine mammal, that's like the most rotten it is, they, they're going to love it a lot. Uh, for tiger gray sharks, sometimes they use... Uh, the animals that they find in the wild, they grab it as a bait, and that's the, the most uh, effective type of bait for sharks. Any other question? We are about to close. Yes? Depends on the species. Um, it's gonna depend on the species. Uh, to get, to be mature, like um, mature, sexually mature, they're gonna, take around 15 years some species. Mm. 15 years to be able to reproduce. So, yes, it could be more than 40 years, 60 years. Yes, uh, for example, they, uh, the, the Greenland shark, given by the isotopes and the carbon, I don't, I don't know how to say those things in, in English, sorry. We, 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 we run some tests. And those sharks, they live up to 400 years. So, yes, but if we cut them first, they're not gonna live that long. By, by the way, those sharks live in, in the really deep, deep, deep sea. That's why they don't have many encounters with big fisheries, right? Okay, last question. Yes. Yell at me, cause my, cause my baby shark is, Okay, so how do we know that a shark is a shark? We're gonna have diff many different things. First of all, you're gonna have a, a fish. Sharks are fishes, but fishes are gonna have scales, right? Sharks do not have scales. They, they have dermal denticles. They're gonna look like little tiny teeth in the skin. If you see it under a microscope, they're gonna look like little tiny teeth. Uh, teeth. Those are going to be helpful for keep them away from parasites and for spitting in the water. They make make them more hydrodynamic. Then, yes, okay. Another difference. Uh, fish are going to be bony fish, which means they're made out of bones, right? Like um, calcium. And sharks do not have bones made out of calcium. They made up. It's made out of a cartilage, like the tip of your nose and your ears, the only hard structure that they're gonna have are the jaw, well, the teeth. That's why we don't have many information about the fossils, because we only have the jaws, so we speculate the rest of the body. And that make them, that make them more flexible, and yes.
like for hunting things. And those are gonna be the, the principal ones, for example. There's more, but yes, we can leave it for another time. Thank you so much for everything. I hope you enjoy it. And please, if you're going in the water, get certified, or at least get a course of like good practices to have good interactions with sharks. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you.